go into the world and tell every man that you meet there is a man on the cross a catholic take what you need to know right now a bold synthesis of inspiration and information keeping you up to date on the news and issues from a courageous catholic perspective a Catholic Take with Joe McLean starts now. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. So good to be on with you. Praise be to God. Hey, the uh, big things happening, like uh, potential UFO invasions. There's been talk about that. But what I find interesting is those that are seemingly paying the most attention are talking about demons, really. In fact, Tucker Carlson seems to think that, and a bunch of other people. But it's this book here, Ursula Bielski, that I want to have a conversation around. She is a Catholic. She spent a long time, many, many years, studying the paranormal, and it cost her big. And she came back to her Catholic faith, and she has a lot to say today. We're going to be linking the dots between UFO, extraterrestrial technology, and maybe even the Antichrist coming on a spaceship. Wouldn't that be interesting? All of that today on the program. Plus, we're going to have a conversation with Michael Hitchborn about those poll results that came out this week. The results of the Real Presence Survey. The number one reason, their number one finding for why U.S. Catholics have uh, dropped in droves from believing in the true presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Communion, standing, and in the hand. We're going to go over that with Michael Hitchborn at 14 past the hour. Did you catch... The Al Smith dinner. Boy, Donald Trump had some zingers. Have a listen to this. All polls are indicating I'm leading big with the Catholic vote, as I should be, as I should be. But I don't think Kamala has given up yet. She hasn't instead of attending tonight. She's in Michigan receiving communion from Gretchen Whitmer. Oof. <laughs> That's not a pretty sight. But Catholics, please don't be too insulted by Kamala's absence. If the Democrats, <laughs> he says, thank you very much, I appreciate it. <laughs> if Democrats really wanted to have someone not be with us this evening, they would have just sent Joe Biden. Ooh, it was a scorcher. There's some fun clips out there. You should check them out. But uh, we're going to be getting into the news today for you. And uh, today is the day when I'm going to sh- send you an email into your into your inbox. Harass your inbox a wee bit on the insiders list. You can go to the station of the cross dot com forward slash ACT. And then uh, you can sign up to the email list at the top of the page there. And uh, today I'm also going to be giving away a Bible from our Bible study, courtesy of tanbooks.com. Thank you very much, Tan for giving me leather-bound Douay Rameses to give away to our Bible study attendees. So anybody who was on the live Bible study Wednesday, they got into that drawing. I'm going to pull a name today. I'll let you know who won in the email. Make sure to get on the email list. I'll also send you the video from the session so you can rewatch it as you like. And that, again, is the stationofthecross.com forward slash A-C-T. Let's pray. Let's get started. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thine intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O Virgin of virgins, my mother. To thee do I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And now your saint of the day. St. Luke, pray for us. Luke hailed from Antioch and was a well-educated physician of Greek descent. He converted sometime after our Lord's ascension, possibly in Tarsus, and soon became a disciple and traveling companion of St. Paul. He attended to Paul during several of the apostles' imprisonments, including the last one before Paul's martyrdom. Saints Matthew and Mark had already written their Gospels when Luke began to write his own, which he did with the assistance of Paul and first-hand testimony from our Lord's disciples, including St. Peter. Some scholars note that Luke may have assisted Peter with his first epistle, due to similarities of style. Luke also wrote the Acts of the Apostles, documenting many events of which he was himself an eyewitness. Luke preached the faith around much of the Mediterranean, living to old age, 
but eventually meeting his martyrdom in Greece. Most accounts hold that he was hanged or crucified on an olive tree by the pagans. Luke is a patron of doctors and physicians, as well as all Christian artists, since he was an artist himself and wrote the first holy icon of the Blessed Mother. Luke's symbol as an evangelist is the ox. For more about this day and others in the Church's calendar, visit thestationofthecross.com slash saintsandseasons. Saint Luke, pray for us. And now your headline news. The Hill is reporting that Yamas, Hamas leader Yahya Sanwe is killed. Yahya Sanwe, the head of the Hamas and the architect of the October 7, 2023 terrorist attack on Israel, was killed yesterday during an Israeli military operation in the Gaza Strip. The military and Shin Bet, the country's internal security service, released a statement confirming some details of the operation. Sinwar was Israel's top target in Gaza, but he survived for more than a year by hiding among the armed group's subterranean tunnel system, surrounding himself with hostages and communicating through letter writing to avoid electronic detection. Catholic News Agency is reporting over 500 Belgians demand removal from baptismal registry after Pope Francis' remarks. While while in Belgium, Pope Francis described the partial decriminalization of voluntary abortion in Belgium as a murderous law. On the return flight from Brussels to Rome on September the 29th, he also called doctors who perform abortions contract killers. Some Belgian organizations called for people to join a de-baptism movement in order to express rejection of the Pope's comments. Three weeks later, 525 people have signed a declaration published in Brussels. In their open letter addressed to the Apostolic Nuncio in Brussels, the primate of the Catholic Church in Belgium, and the seven Catholic dioceses in the country, the signers condemned certain comments made by the Pope and called for themselves to be removed from the baptismal registry. Golly, you is. What was that that Peter said? Oh, yeah. For where else should we go? For you alone have the words of eternal life. Anyway, Catholic Vote reports Trump speaks at a Al Smith dinner. Harris sends video in. Donald Trump delivered a humorous speech at the Al Smith dinner Thursday night, receiving laughs and applause from the crowd on multiple occasions. Meanwhile, Kamala Harris, who controversially did not attend the dinner, Instead, sent in a video last minute pre-recorded with the comedian Molly Shannon. Trump said during his speech, Catholics, you got to vote for me. You have to remember, I'm here and she's not. And those, those are your headline news. The gospel today on this uh, feast day for St. Luke comes to us from Luke chapter 10, verses 1 through 9. And after these things, the Lord appointed also other seventy-two, and he sent them two by two before his face into every city and place whither he himself was to come. And he said to them, The harvest indeed is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore that the Lord of the harvest, that he send laborers into his harvest. Go, behold, I send you as lambs among wolves, Carry neither purse, nor script, nor shoes, and salute no man by the way. Into whatsoever house you enter first, say, Peace be to this house. And if the Son of Peace be there, your peace shall rest upon him. But if not, it shall return to you. And in the same house remain eating and drinking such things as they have, for the labor is worthy of his hire. Remove not from the house to house, and into whatever city you enter, And they receive you, eat such things as are set before you, and heal the sick that are therein, and say to them, The kingdom of God has come nigh upon you. But into whatsoever city you enter, and they receive you not, going forth into the streets thereof say, Even the very dust of your city that cleaveth to us we wipe off against you. Yet know this, that the kingdom of God is at hand. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Boy, it is, uh, it is Friday and the struggle is real. Amen. <laughs> hey, Cornelius Alapide had a lot to say today, and uh, I'm glad to be able to sneak some Cornelius Alapide commentary in. It's really, truly fantastic. By the way, you can Google 
the great commentary of Cornelius Alapide, and you will find it online for free. You should check it out. I would recommend it. But he says that as Moses, at the beginning of his leadership, chose elders or princes for the 12 tribes of Israel, and afterwards, by reason of increase of the people and of their cares of government, made a further choice of six from each tribe, i.e. 72, to act as rulers. So Christ ordained that each tribe should have its apostle and six presbyters or elders for each of these uh, who were disciples who were commanded to go throughout all Judea, preaching that the kingdom of God and of Christ was nigh, and confirming their preaching by miracles, that so the work of the apostles might be furthered and spread. He goes on, This number was mystically prefigured by the 72 translators of the Septuagint, by the men of the elders of the people, whom Moses chose in Numbers eleven sixteen, by the number of the Sanhedrin, and by the wells and palms of the of the trees in Elium in Exodus fifteen twenty seven. The number seventy two is very significant, and as I've said many times, and I'll repeat here again, this is why Caiaphas was very much alarmed at what what this Messiah was doing, what our Lord was doing. He had his inner three. Peter, James, and John. He had his 12 apostles, and he had his 72. To Caiaphas, Jesus was a competitor for ruling the people, and he wasn't going to have any competition. So he calls in a favor to his buddy Pilate, and the rest is, as they say, history. We need to to understand what's truly in sacred scripture, and we need to understand that big picture. And if you can't see the patterns, and if you can't see the design, then maybe you should join us in the Bible study. Go to thestationofthecross.com forward slash ACT and get signed up today. We'll be right back. More is coming up right after this break. Don't go anywhere. Did you know you can help evangelize simply by using your cell phone? The Station of the Cross is partnering with iCatholic Mobile, America's only Catholic mobile phone company. When you join iCatholic Mobile, a portion of every dollar will support our programming. Plus, you'll enjoy great service with iCatholic Unlimited 5G data, text, and talk. With iCatholic Mobile, you can stay connected with family and friends while also spreading the truth of Jesus Christ with clarity and charity. Join today at iCatholicMobile.com. Be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. So good to be on with you. Praise be to God. Hey, it is Friday, and uh, by the grace of God, we get to go to the weekend. But before we do, we're going to have some great conversations. And today, I want to have a conversation at 30 past the hour about this book right here, Ursula Bielski, The Devil in Dreamland, Catholic Faith, UFOs, the Occult, and the End, and the End of the supernatural. And it's very fascinating because she spent uh, a career in the paranormal and she paid the price for it. You play with fire, you get burned. We're going to talk about that, but it's really, could it be that the Antichrist will come under the guise of an alien? Aliens are demons, you know. We're going to have that conversation at 30 past and that ought to be very interesting. But speaking of very interesting, there was a brand new poll that came out this past week. The review results of the Real Presence survey, and we're going to put a link to it, realpresencecoalition.com. I covered this on the show in the news, but I think it's utterly fascinating. Michael Hitchborn is here to talk about these results. Good morning to you, Michael. Thank you for your time. Good morning, Joe. Thank you for having me back on. Wow. Praise be to God. So this is very fascinating. I want to jump into this and, and ask you some questions about it because when I went and reviewed the executive summary, we're going to link to it in the show notes, by the way. The executive summary, one of the things that I saw right out of the gate was the vast majority of the respondents were not rad trads. They were Novus Ordo going Catholics. Tell me about the demo of the respondents. Yeah, so one of the first things that uh, people need to understand, this is the single largest survey of lay Catholics ever completed in the United States. Uh, There were a total of 15,843 responses. And when you start to take that kind of massive amount of information, the, the, the number of people that they surveyed, uh, it's, it's not just a valid survey. It's, it's a, almost a certainty that this is the mind of the of faithful Catholics throughout the country. So when you look at the fact that this is not a rad trad survey, that the majority of the people that, that took the survey are they're, they're your common, everyday, mass-going Catholics. Yeah. Uh, 
this this speaks to the mind of the church. And if we're talking about synodality and we're talking about this uh, this desire to listen to the people of the church, well, this is the way to do it. Yeah, it really is very fascinating. And there was a quite a large sample size as well. I want to say some 16,000 respondents mm-hmm. and almost 15,000 of those were U.S. lay Catholics representing people from every diocese in the country. So let me just play devil's advocate for a second, Michael. Is it possible to say, is there any means of saying that this is a skewed result? That the results of this poll are very myopically and narrowly focused on just those, you know, more fervent elements of the church, and they don't represent hmm. mainstream Catholic America? Well, I mean, this is kind of a, <laughs> this is central to the faith. So what we're talking about is is not some fringe dogma or some fringe right. ideology within the church. We're talking about something that is at the very core. It's at the very heart. Uh, and it's a very simple truth. Why is, uh, what is it that we believe about the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist? And that's, that's kind of the essence of the whole survey. But the, then from there, the question is, if, if that is the core belief of the, of the faith, then why are so many Catholics not believing or not acting as if they believe this? And so the, the right. purpose of the survey was to, to, just to kind of get an understanding what went wrong. What is what is the issue here? What is it that led people away from this belief? And how do we fix that? And and we think that that goes right in line with what the um, National Eucharistic Congress was all about. So they boiled it down, 28 issues, down to five of the main contributors that they say, based on these results, are the five leading causes for what for why Catholics are failing or no longer believing or the majority of Catholics no longer believing in the true presence of Christ in the Eucharist and a lack of reverence. They've gone from 28 down to five. Take us through those five. Sure. So the first one has to do with uh, how one receives the Holy Eucharist. This is the largest uh, set of responses that um, the majority said that this was the leading contributing factor to people leaving the faith or losing the faith uh, in understanding the true presence of Christ in the Eucharist, and that is receiving the Eucharist in the hand while standing. And I'll read to you what it says here. It says, Many respondents advocate for the reception of the Eucharist kneeling and on the tongue, reflecting greater reverence and respect for the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Concerns were raised about the practice of receiving communion in the hand, as it is believed to lead to a loss of reverence and increases the risk of profaning the Eucharist. And they also, incidentally, expressed a discomfort with the use of extraordinary ministers of Holy Communion, suggesting that only priests and deacons should distribute the Eucharist. Amen. So that's the that's the number one issue. Um, that's a big one. This that's was, a huge one. Well, and let's remember the the idea of receiving communion in the hand was an innovation that was introduced after the council. And and well after mm. the uh, the beginning or the introduction of the new mass, uh, and it was allowed as a permission for abuses that were already taking place. Yeah, yeah. This is I have to imagine this is like earthquake stuff here for most. You know, as Father McTagg would say, Saint typical parishes. You know, like the the suburban Nova Sordo typical parish. This is this is this the mode of operation here. They have the long lines of communion uh, and uh, all of the extraordinary uh, ministers of, of Holy Communion. They're lined up every Sunday, no matter what. It's always the same thing. So to, to hear that this is the number one issue based on a majority of respondents who also go to St. Typicals in Nova Sordo parishes, that's a big deal. If they're saying this, do you think the bishops are going to hear that message? I really hope so. Uh, the The fact of the matter is that this is a because this is the single largest survey ever taken of Catholics in the country. It's going to be very hard for bishops to ignore this, and if they yeah. do, they do so at their own peril. Truly, um, wow. The and, and and the thing is, the whole issue of communion in the hand being the number one issue, very closely behind that, uh, the next issue that that uh, people were responding to is the scandal created by offering the Holy Eucharist to public sinners who obstinately reject Catholic teaching. 
Now, right. I'll tell you, um, I was the head of the Canon 915 project when I was at American Life League many years ago. Mm. And I had conversations with many bishops about the problem of having some bishops denying communion to pro-abortion politicians and others not. Uh, and what <laughs> one conversation that I had with a particular cardinal, uh, he told me personally that, you know, well, with regard to Canon 915, of course, the, the sinner knows that they're not supposed to approach for communion when they <laughs> know that they have a, a, a mortal sin on their soul. And I said, your eminence, that's Canon 916. Canon 915 puts the onus on the one distributing communion. And he said, well, that's according to your interpretation. And I said, <laughs> I said, oh, my interpretation, how else is it to be interpreted? He goes, I don't have to tell you that. Uh, how convenient I, is that, huh? Right. And, and I said, your eminence, I'm not trying to be belligerent. I am a loyal son of the church and I am confused by what's taking place here. And his immediate reaction was to change the subject and never go back. Of course. It, it kind of reminds me of the Kamala interview with uh, Brett Baer the other day on Fox News. Mm. <laughs> Meanwhile, Trump's running for office, you know. I mean, that's just what we're getting. It's right. more of the same in the church here. So that's a big deal. That first issue, receiving the Eucharist in the hand while standing, that is the number one contributor to why most Catholics today fail to understand that Christ is truly present in the Eucharist. But that's not the, bi that's not the only issue. That's just the biggest issue. And that is an earthquake, in my, my opinion. Take us to point number two. Well, point number two is the uh, Holy Eucharist, uh, uh, the um, for for unrepentant sinners. When you give Holy Communion to unrepentant sinners, Nancy publicly Pelosi, manifestly, Joe Biden, you know, anyone, yeah, exactly. anyone, uh huh, right. So and that's par for the course these days. Yes, it, it's par for the course. And again, you have bishops who are divided on this, uh, and it, it it causes scandal. It causes great scandal because you're telling people, well, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with a publicly man manifest sinner, one who is an effective apostate from the faith, receiving Holy Communion. They're saying they're in communion with Christ and with me when they're not. Yeah. So yeah. the third issue, and let's go to the third one. The third issue is the lack of humility and reverence for the presence of the Eucharist. So what they're talking about here is people dressing casually for mass, talking yeah. loudly while, while the tabernacle is there in the front. You've got Criticism of the clergy's lack of reverence, uh, reports of priests rushing through liturgical prayers and, and failing to handle the Eucharist with care. So that's a very grave concern. The fourth one is the clergy's casual attitude toward the Eucharist. So this is kind of connected to that. Oh, but, boy, yes. You know, if you have a priest who doesn't give manifest reverence to the Eucharist during the Mass or after the Mass, uh, doesn't encourage, say, uh, adoration, um, doesn't, you know, reverence the Eucharist while passing the tabernacle. Uh, these are very grave concerns because people see what the priest does in the church before, during, and after Mass. And the way he reverences the Eucharist is going to set the tone for how the congregation reverences the Eucharist. It's just a it, it's it's the way sheep work. You know, we uh, we follow the leader. Yeah, we sure and do. Fifth, and it's a big one. I, mm -hmm. I've, I, in fact, this this week I shared some anecdotal stories to illustrate these points. And one of them was on uh, clergy's you know, casual attitude. Uh, going to a daily mass years ago and seeing this priest just have, I, I have to believe the priest didn't believe in the true presence of Christ in the Eucharist, just be, based on his behavior. It would be hard to come to other conclusions. And I know many in our audience have similar, similar stories to share, but that's what we're dealing with today. All right, point number five, go ahead. Point number five is failure to catechize the faithful and transubstantiation. And what they're saying here is that there's an inadequate catechesis uh, affecting both children and adults, yeah. And there's a strong call for better religious education in Catholic schools, CCD programs, and for adults. So what they're saying is that um, even in catechesis, uh, they're not emphasizing reverence for the Eucharist. The, 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 I mean, again, this is a core belief. It's fundamental to what we as Catholics believe in how we practice our faith. And yeah. if you're not putting that at the center, what, what, what's filling the void? And what's filling yeah. the void is social justice. Uh, this idea that, well, you have to go into the community and that's what's central to the faith. Well, hey, look, 
going out and helping the poor is definitely a large aspect of our faith. But if it doesn't start with the Eucharist, you've got nothing to stand on. Yeah, amen. Well said. In fact, under the recommendations to the bishops, again, I'm going to link to this in the show notes today, but you can check out this entire survey at realpresencecoalition.com. But the number one, the number one recommendation was to encourage the practice of receiving the Eucharist on the tongue and kneeling. Make the altar rail great again. That's great news, in my opinion, Michael. Absolutely. And almost 30 percent of all the respondents made that their number one issue. Wow, that's a big deal. This is a big deal. This was not just a survey of traditional Catholics. This was a survey of St. Typical Catholics from all over the country. And if yep. they're saying this, I got to say, that says a lot to me. And I think it's good news. Maybe there's a turning of hearts back towards God and greater reverence and intentionality and liturgy. No more clown masses. Praise be to God. Let's call for that. Michael Hitchborn, I really appreciate your time today. God bless you and God love you, my friend. If you, if you want to come back for the after show, you're welcome to do it. But we're going to put a link to the website, realpresencecoalition.com. That's realpresencecoalition.com. Coming up after the break, though, I want to have a great conversation. Could it be, could it be that the Antichrist will come by way of alien spacecraft? Hmm. Fascinating book, The Devil in Dreamland. That and more is up next. Don't go anywhere. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean, and here, here are your headline news. Breitbart is reporting Amazon bets big on small nuclear reactors. Amazon has announced three major deals to develop and deploy small modular nuclear reactors to power its data centers in Virginia, Washington, and other states. The tech giant has partnered with Dominion Energy, Energy Northwest, and nuclear startup X Energy to bring more than five gigawatts of new power projects online by 2039, enough electricity to power a mid-sized city. Data centers, particularly those focused on AI applications, consume massive amounts of electricity, with AI-oriented facilities using around 80 megawatts compared to 32 of the typical data center. Hey, Just the News is reporting Catholic Archdiocese of Los Angeles agrees to $880 million settlement. The Catholic Archdiocese of Los Angeles has agreed to an $880 million settlement related to abuse claims made by more than 1,300 victims going back to the 1940s. To date, the Archdiocese of Los Angeles has paid out close to $1.5 billion, with a B, since 2007. Other dioceses in California have had to file for bankruptcy protection after similar lawsuits. And LifeSite News is reporting Cardinal Zinn sounds the alarm, warns that Senate aims to overthrow church's hierarchy for democratic system. Cardinal Joseph Zinn has issued a strong warning about the Senate on synodality and the persistent division resulting from fiducia supplicans, saying that the future of the church is uncertain unless issues are resolved. Members of the Synod are currently discussing whether to afford local bishops' conferences increased autonomy, including on whether to be able to decide doctrine on a local level, no matter how the Vatican feels about it. The question has reportedly received incredible, tremendous pushback in the Synod Hall from the Synod delegates. It was a big day on Wednesday, and very few people even know about it. But it remains to be seen what the final document will recommend, despite the overwhelming pushback against this move. And those, those are your headline news. Hey, praise be to God. I don't know if you saw this clip. Uh, I guess this was a, about a month or so ago. Just I'll play a couple of seconds. Tucker Carlson responding to why he no longer wants to know more about UFO UAP stories. It's not the, the audio doesn't want to play, but I'll just summarize it for you because the Internet demon today is messing with us. Tucker said he doesn't want to know anymore. Why not? Because he's pretty, con- uh, pretty convinced that we're not talking about aliens from Mars. We're talking about demons and uh, and their effects on mankind aren't good. I also found a clip. I'll link to both of these for you in the show notes so you can watch them for yourself. But uh, a former FBI agent who apparently 
his work helped to contribute to the X-Files season one. He spent 25 years for the FBI. He doesn't seem like a believer to me. But what he does seem to suggest is that there's a difference between those little, you know, little pills that you see flying around the sky and Navy pilots talking about and actual alien technology, extraterrestrials that seem to be immaterial, spiritual-like beings. I'm a Catholic. I'd call those demons. And it seems like I'm not alone in that. In fact, there's a brand new book out uh, called The Devil in Dreamland, A Catholic Faith, UFOs, the Occult, and the End of the Supernatural by Ursula Bielski. It's a great book. I've been going through it. I do recommend you check it out. And we're going to link to it in the show notes. Good, Good morning to you, Ursula. Thank you for your time. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me to Joe. It's, this book is very fascinating, and I want to start right out of the gate. I do want to get a bit of your story, but I kind of want to start right away with something that I found. One of the most absolutely fascinating things for me was uh, on the, the issue of the Antichrist, because I've heard this theory before. In fact, I've, I've spoken to Daniel O'Connor about his book as well. And on page 218, oh, yeah. you say, Gabriel predicts uh, apocalyptic events such as the return of Jesus Christ on a mothership, spaceship, and a forthcoming planetary evacuation for which he and his followers are preparing. This this is several stories that you share in the book. And uh, then there was the one about the, the guys that were in the military that went AWOL. They came to a conference back in the United States, and they were receiving instruction. Right. They were receiving their instruction through Ouija boards, through Ouija boards. And part of yep. what they said, and, too, was they mm-hmm. expected the Antichrist to come by way of a spaceship from outer space. There's lots of stories that are similar to that. It would seem that it might be very, very uh, interesting to, con- to contemplate that the Antichrist could come in a means that would convince both Jews and Muslims, as well as many Christians, Buddhists, Hindus, and everybody else, to all be in the same, on the same page in worshiping him as a promised Messiah. I think that might be the way that gets done. What do you say? Yeah, it's very interesting. That theme runs through ufology going back decades, this idea that there's some kind of uh, of trajectory that we're on to get everybody, like you said, on the same page and to essentially end up removing, kind of forcing people to remove all of our biases so that the extraterrestrials can deal with us as just the human race. And that, of course, will start with religion. So we'll have to get rid of all of our religions so that we can all be on the same page to advance under the tutelage of these of these beings that are, of course, um, you know, so much superior to us. And that's very disturbingly runs through all of ufology, including through the secular crowd. And they've, of course, been raised on most recently ancient aliens, which is, you know, this blockbuster television show that teaches that aliens created us, you know, aliens created Jesus and that they're going to come back and save us from ourselves eventually. You know, it's fascinating. I was thinking about that, too, as I was going through your book yesterday, because there is you you see all these pictographs on stones and caves all over the world. And there's a lot of commonalities. In fact, just the other day, I was looking at one in particular that looked like it it was a figure that had like uh, feathered wings or something along those lines. But they found this same almost exact same pictograph and places all over the earth. So there was a common thread there. It wouldn't surprise me in the least, given especially original sources like Bernal Diaz's uh, conquest of New Spain with Hernan Cortez fighting, fighting the Aztecs. You see, you see these themes. It wouldn't surprise me at all to know that the, the demons have tried this trick before. After all, as you say in your book, you even talk about how the, the, the stories of, um, of pagan cultures in the past that have had this idea of demons and humans mixing in intercourse and things of, of those natures. So it seems to be an old story being told all over again, only now we're seeing it from modern eyes, and so we think it's new, but it's really not. Well, it's so interesting because um, even the earliest and the most prominent secular ufologists, like, for example, Jacques Vallée. Jacques Vallée, um, for those who don't know, he was the inspiration for Steven Spielberg for the, the character of the French scientist in Close Encounters of the Third Kind. So he's a real person, and he is the most respected ufologist and 
in the 19, late 1960s, he was already saying these are not physical beings. These are some kind of paraphysical entities that we're dealing with. And he was one of the first to talk about the fact that the way that these things, the way that they interact with humans, the things that humans are identical to the, the things example fair doing in, um, in the cultures of Europe, for example. And they're just in a different guise. And now I think it's really important to point this out. And I don't know Daniel O'Connor always is, is make sure to point this out too. 97% of these encounters are explicable, right? They acknowledge um, day when you know, if there was you know hot the most high tech technology, it, it was the government. But today there is you know hundreds of billions of dollars in research and technology in the private sector. So the government doesn't even know what's going on. And the, I think the hugest part of this whole thing is governments trying to cover up what they what they do know. You know, their their space programs and their technology programs, and to cover up what they don't know. So it's a way to say like that they. It's a way for them to sort of get out of the fact that they don't know what's going yeah. on, whether it's other government, foreign governments or whether right. it's our private um, sector research. Um, so most of this is technology, governmental programs, private sector technology and governments, delusions, illusions, wishful thinking, you know, right. so many people that want this stuff to be true. Um, and then there's that small percentage. And I talk about this in the book that as someone who's been involved in paranormal research for, it's been almost four decades now that I've been, you know, investigating cases um, of paranormal activity. And a lot of that has been demonic. And you notice that those same things that the devil does in those kinds of cases, it, it, the devil's doing in these space you know spacecraft ufo and alien visitation cases and one of those things is mimicry where the mm. devil takes the form of the guise of what someone wants to see is what someone expects to see and i see this over and over again in paranormal investigation of ghosts and hauntings and things and that's i think what's happening in a lot of these cases people are want dust this is the a religion for so many people and they oh, yeah. really think that we are going to be saved by the technology of the extraterrestrials and people want to see spaceships they want to have relationships with extraterrestrials people are summoning aliens on a daily basis people belong to groups that summon aliens at the same time every they're day fire. so there is this, this, it's crazy but there's worldwide yeah. seances going on essentially where people are trying to commune with these beings and a lot of these gurus these scientists you know james greer those pe those kinds of people they are they are leading seances yeah. i've seen it it's it's insane i want we're gonna we're gonna hit a here in a moment, but I want to get to uh, one of these other fascinating elements from your book, page 58. You talk about Alistair Crowley and uh, and his little house up on uh, 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 up in Scotland. Right. And uh, and I thought that right. was incredibly fascinating link for us. If you could Alistair Crowley and the Roswell event, 1947 and the UFO craze that we're all air quotes enjoying these days. How is Alistair Crowley connected to that? Yeah, it's really fascinating. And this is all common knowledge to ufologists who know the, the, all of these intricacies and all these characters. But Aleister Crowley was extremely influential on the founder of Jet Propulsion Laboratory, Jack Parsons, who was a major occultist. Um, and he's, you know, the father of rocketry. We wouldn't have NASA without Jack Parsons. He was housemates with L. Ron Hubbard, founder of Scientology. Wow. In 1940s, yeah, it's crazy. In 1946, Jack Parsons and L. Ron Hubbard um, performed a ritual that was that Crowley called the Babylon Working, which was essentially to bring about the the birth of the Whore of Babylon and the end of Judeo Christian civilization. They did this out in the desert um, in California. And um, that was 1946. So, yeah, 1947, a lot of people believe that it was Jack Parsons that initiated this rash of UFO sightings through this Babylon working. And um, it's uh, 
kind of part of the UFO folklore that the government actually interrogated him about this when the, the UFO sightings began. Roswell, for example, that same year we had the Kenneth Arnold UFO sightings uh, on the West Coast. And that he essentially said, yeah, it was my fault. <laughs> and after he, mm. he blew himself up in his laboratory not long after, and there was a rash of UFO sightings immediately after over Washington, D.C. And so, uh, yeah, and that's, it's out there, you know, was there, was there some sort of rift in space and time that was opened with these rituals that <sighs> let this flood of demonic yeah. UFOs in? Um I don't know, but it's definitely part of the folklore and the the legends, you know, of the UFO phenomenon. Oh, man. Yeah, I got to tell you, when I was reading through this and seeing those connections that you were making between, you know, 1947, Aleister Crowley and uh, and the UFOs out at, at Roswell and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, I was also thinking about Our Lady of Revelation at Trey Fontane in 1947, who warned of a calamity that would consume a third of the earth in fire. In 1947, so the dots are, are incredible connected. But, uh, you know, I have to say, I've seen the documentary film Ghostbusters. I grew up on that. And we all, they, 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 the kid, they joked about opening this portal with this other dimension, letting yeah. these creatures come through. Right. Turns out that's uh, not so far fetched. When you play with fire, you get burned. And uh, I want to talk more about that on the other side of the break from your own experiences, Ursula. Because it seems like with your years of experience in the occult, you might have played a little bit with fire. So let's talk up a little bit about that. Coming after the break, we're going to link to the book and more. More conversation is headed your way. Don't go anywhere. Be right back. Jesus Christ, welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. Praise be to God. It's good to be on with you. It's Friday. We have survived the week. Congratulations. You get to go to the weekend. But before you do, let's have a conversation about something that I think your friends, your neighbors, they might be misled by, and that is aliens from outer space. In fact, some are thinking that the government is planning a UFO invasion, not with green men from Mars, but rather with earthly bound technologies to help manipulate us. Manipulation, father of lies. I'm seeing connections here with the devil, with the diabolic, and the loss of so many souls in this story. In fact, there's a book that we're having a conversation about, The Devil in Dreamland, Catholic Faith, UFOs, Occultism, and the End of the Supernatural by Ursula Bielski. She's our guest today. Worldofthesupernatural.com is her website. We'll put a link to it in the show notes so you can check it out for yourself. Ursula, welcome back to the show. Uh, I got to tell you, I was very fascinated by your book. I'd like to spend even more time with it. But one of those things that I want to talk about that I think is very important is you play with fire, you get burned. It's a common story, even in your own book, how many times the Ouija board or seances or these little occult, uh, you know, witchcraft like wizardry practices like uh, Aleister Crowley and his like were doing. But you were giving tours to ghost haunted sites and all this stuff for so long. On page 177, you say it soon became apparent that there was something accompanying a number of our tour guest home after these events. And in short order, I was introduced with emails and phone calls from attendees. You go on to say my staff wasn't exempt from these developments. Many of them became inexplicably sick. And one of, one of our guides, also a self-professed psychic medium, developed an illness her doctor couldn't explain. You go on to talk about that. Even in your own circumstances, page 253, you say during these years, it was not uncommon for me to wake up with bruises on my body, scratches, scars. You'd been attacked. And uh, I find that interesting because the curiosity kills the cat, right? Like that's one of the stories we yeah. like. These, well, that's why uh, History Channel and the Discovery Channel make so much money off of haunted house stories and, and the paranormal. That's why there's so many people involved in this. There's also a common thread in the lives of the people involved in those shows. Is there not? Tell me about that. There is, absolutely. And, you know, it's natural for us to have a curiosity about the supernatural and the paranormal. And I think there's nothing wrong with that sort of scientific part of us that wants to learn more about it. And I talk a lot about that at, towards the end of the book about the way that different theologians are um, and apologists in the Catholic Church are. Yes. Um, 
you know, are approaching it. And it's like, we can't do that thing where we, where we, we indulge in things that God has forbidden um, in the interest of science. You know, we're not exempt from God's laws because, you know, we have an interest in science. Right. But there is that common theme, you know, through pe- in people that get too interested in these things, that there is not a grounding in faith. And um, I found myself telling people over and over, thinking that I was safe, you know, don't go to these uh, places where we know that there is demonic activity um, un- unless you're grounded in faith, unless you're healthy, like it, don't go if you're sick and things like that. Don't expose yourself to these things. But for the most part, people do not have a grounding in faith, or if they do, they are willing to sacrifice that, um, again, for the interest of science or for that thrill. Um, and the main thing that has really taken so many people in in, the, in paranormal research is spirit communication. Mm. Uh, when I started out as a paranormal investigator, I spent 25 years not doing any of that. I mean, we would do environmental monitoring at locations, would interview people. It would never have occurred to us to try to talk to spirits, you know, at the location. But that is the number one thing now. It's called electronic voice phenomenon is the main um, thing that people do trying to record or actually have real time conversations with spirits using things like ghost radios, ghost boxes and things like that, or traditional, more traditionally psychic mediums. And it is, uh, it's a plague on people today. It used to be a very small number of people that were really involved in the occult, but it's just ordinary people by the millions today that are involved in this. And it's the same kind of thing that has been happening throughout ufology too, where we have all sorts of people that became really celebrities in ufology that I believe were, were the victims of uh, familiarization by demons, where you have those same kinds of relationships. Um, Malachi Martin wrote about a famous one, a, a radio broadcaster named Jamsey wrote about in Hostage to the Devil that was yeah. familiarized by this demon. And you see cases exactly like that all through ufology, starting with the, the early contact D movement in the 1950s. But there is that, that is always the common thing. People do not have a grounding in faith. They don't have a grounding in God and in Jesus, and they are easily uh, taken in and manipulated by these things. And it's, um, you know, it, it's tragic and you try to fight against it, but it's such a wave. It's so strong. Yeah, and your whole section, page 307, Trekkies of the Vatican, I, I like that title, by the way, uh, you you talk quite a bit, it's a pretty good section about how many apologists there seem to be within the Catholic Church that seems to want to find some way for all of this to be okay, some way for interdimensional beings and and UFOs and aliens yeah. from outer space. I yeah. mean, it, it, it boggles the mind why why any Catholic would want to somehow explain this into to something that's acceptable. Well, I think there are two two things that are very related that are going on and one is uh, you, you see the strong presence of the Jesuits throughout all of this, you know, with the Vatican astronomers promoting this, they're Jesuits. Um you there's there's actually a subgenre of science fiction called Jesuits known, known as Jesuits in space that are about Jesuits <laughs> that go out and meet extraterrestrials. But there's that thing, you know, the history of the Jesuits being so into science. And that's something that just as as Catholics, we all have a history of we want to be on, you know, the right side of science and we want to be on the cutting edge of everything. And I think even the Pope is um, he's right up there saying he would baptize Martians and all of that, you know. know. So there's that. But there is also just prevalent throughout the last hundred years, even more. The intro, the just this obsession with science fiction and technology, and um, I wrote about this in the book a lot about how a lot of the science fiction that we've all been exposed to is channeled material. You know, authors that have written it have channeled it from space people and spirits. You know, and this has worked its way all through insidiously through our culture. And so we have people like, I mean, I talk about Jimmy Aiken. I talk about Paul Thigpen. I talk about Diana Mm. Pasolka, who's probably not as well known um, to um, 
you know, uh, Catholics, but she is very well known in ufology and is like an icon of, of in ufology who are really on board with this idea that that AI and aliens and extraterrestrials are going to make a better world for us. And um, it's so dangerous. And it's it's so crazy when you because when I started thinking about this, I thought about, okay, you know, I was raised just like most Catholics where our parents, you know, my mom always said, why would God make the whole universe and only put life on one planet? And that seemed like a reverent thing to say when you don't really think through it. And then after five minutes, you realize that it's impossible for there to be intelligent life on other planets. It's just, you can't be a Christian and think about it. And Daniel O'Connor has written about that in his 900 page book, you know, to exhaust and exhaust I, yeah, inter- absolutely. I, underlined and that, there's- I underlined that part in your book, too, when you talked about that, that God's ways are, are far above our ways. And if you stop to think about it, it right. makes sense. Like, if we designed the universe, of course we'd have, you know, aliens on foreign planets all over the galaxy. Why not? That'd be cool to do and travel back and forth and hang out and whatever. But the reality is God right. didn't design it the way we would. He designed it the way he did. And we have to fit into his That's universe, right. not vice versa. And uh, I'll, I, we have exactly to say goodbye correct. to the radio audience. If you want to hang out for the live video feed, you're welcome to. We can continue our conversation. I think Michael Hitchborn's back. But I do recommend great. you check out the book. It's a great book, The Devil in Dreamland, Catholic Faith, UFOs, Occultism, and the End of the Supernatural. You know, college whiz, you don't have to be a rocket scientist or this retired FBI agent who claims to say that the government's going to enact a UFO invasion to bring about a world one, war, one world government to come to the conclusion that you shouldn't play with the devil, the demons, or the occult. Stay away from it. We'll see you Monday. God love you. Catholic Radio has just been a lifesaver for me. I still listen to it every day. I start my day with it. I listen to it all day long as much as I can. I am very grateful for it. It's just an amazing thing to have as I am new to Catholicism. Obviously, it's not only helping me, but it's helping so many other people on their walk. Thank you. God bless you for iCatholic Radio. It has changed my life. Donate today at thestationofthecross.com. And we're back. Welcome to the after show, everyone, and happy Friday. And I'm glad I have the uh, the triple screen set up still in place because I think we've got uh, we've got both uh, Ursula and Michael Hitchborn staying for the after show with us. Well, good good morning, everybody. Thanks for hanging out, man. Fridays. What is the deal with Fridays? And why is it every time I go to talk about something related to to the demonic dark forces? Uh, that there's just nothing but tech problems and issues. I mean, it's like it's like clockwork yep. almost. I mean, it really is. If yes, if, if is. the lottery were this easy to predict, I'd be wealthy. I'd be as wealthy as as Michael Hitchborn. Praise be to God. Speaking of which, come on. Oh. <laughs> I'm, I'm, te- I'm teasing. It's a joke. It's a joke. I'm he does that to me too, Michael. Don't worry about it. I do. I do. It's true. So hey. y- you know, Joe. Actually, to your point about you know dealing with the demonic and having things break. Yeah. I ran a series of articles exposing the fact that WSOU, a radio station owned by a Catholic church, the Catholic church, <laughs> under I the auspices of Cardinal this. Tobin out in Newark, yeah. every time I ran a story on that, stuff in my house would break, right. uh, my computer would stop working, my website would go down, yeah. every single time. Yeah. Like clockwork. Mm-hmm. You gotta love it. You gotta love it. Hey, uh, it's interesting, the timing of things. And uh, so, Ursula, I want to ask you a question because I want to give you uh, there's a I just got an email just now, just literally just now from a priest in in the UK because somebody reached out to me uh, and said that they had been possessed now for a long time and they've come to this. They're working with a exorcist to help them overcome this and be freed from it. And and part of the story was about some of the things that the demons were saying through him. So I reached out to the priest to ask for verification. Hey, you know, is this guy legit? What's the deal here? The priest just responded. But the reason why I'm bringing it up is because of some of the things that the, that the, are being claimed that the demons are sharing. And in like in your book, and that one story about those AWOL uh, guys in the, uh, in the intelligence, military intelligence that went AWOL, came to Miami for the big conference and and ultimately, they're communicating with demons through Ouija boards, and they claim that the Antichrist is going to come through an alien spaceship. 
How much should we trust any information that comes to us by way of demons? Not at all. <laughs> I mean, it's it happens all the time. And this has been one of the most difficult things for me since I left that occult aspect of paranormal investigation behind. And, you know, like just about every friend I had, and I still have many friends who are psychic mediums who claim to be in constant communication with spirits. And, you know, they'll say that they are the spirits of the dead, right? They are people who have died that are speaking to us and giving us information. And it's been extremely difficult to try and navigate that, you know, these people are my friends. And I've come to the realization that the information that they are getting is not from dead people, but it is from demons. Mm. And the biggest problem with trying to, to get people to stop being a part of this whole world and to engage in this kind of activity is that a lot of that information is correct. And so you have, for example, mediums that help, you know, lost children, be found, be found or spouses or what have you. So they'll find, they'll, they'll help us find lost children. They'll help us find dead bodies. They'll help us, um, you know, resolve family conflicts. They'll help, they'll bring people, you know, this peace when a loved one has passed away and they get these messages that only the person who died could have known Well, the person who died and the demons. Right. So yeah. they seem to, they, they do do all of this good. Right. Because people don't realize that they're all about the end game. So if they can draw mm -hmm. you into communication with them and can develop relationships with you and then you get on board with them and you depend on them and then they can do whatever they want to you at the end because they have you. And that's but it's difficult because they have that information that people want now and the information that people so desperately need now. And again, it comes back to not having that that faith, that grounding in God and that trust in God to provide us what we need and the knowledge that we need and to accept that we don't have to know everything. But yeah. when you're in that situation where you're grieving or if you, God forbid, you, your, your child is missing or your spouse is missing or, um, you know, some, some absolutely ultimate tragic thing that you're undergoing, you'll do anything. The temptation and, um, is great. Accept yeah. any information, right? Wow. So, as as far as um, you know, accepting information from the demonic, yeah, a lot of the times it's true what they're telling us. Um, but we should. But it comes with lots of baggage, and, <laughs> and we should reject absolutely. it. Absolutely. <laughs> and the uh, bottom get... line is always: do not engage. Do not engage in conversation with these things. Do yeah. not. And the exorcist will tell us that. Don't talk yeah. to the demon. Like yeah, that page three thirty one. You make that one. very clear. Through page three thirty one, you make that very clear. The number one door to the devil and the diabolic is uh, is through the occult, right? I mean, through all of these occult like and tangentially occult like yeah. practices. And I and I think you even said yoga. I, I throw yoga in that mix. I think we oh, play yeah, with fire. Absolutely we play yoga. with fire when we're doing this. You want to stretch, stretch. You don't need to do yoga. Okay. <laughs> like if right. you wanna you wanna you wanna breathe, breathe. Is, you don't need to do yoga. Like right. it's just all, the way it is. You know, we are the only you know, the, the Christian church is the only church where we do not want to lose ourselves, right? We don't want to lose right. our minds. We don't want to empty our minds. That's danger to us. But in our culture today, we have all of these Eastern religions that say, empty your mind, you know. And I know, you know the whole centering yeah. prayer and it's thing. It's like, no, it, don't it, empty God, your you mind. Like, wh like, why yeah. do you feel the need to go like... We've got to go find some truth some other place. It's called the fullness of truth for a reason, people. Okay? It's the Catholic yeah. faith. It's the gift of God uh, to humanity. We should embrace it. Let me give some shout-outs real quick uh, from our Telegram group. Damon, good morning. Kevin, Jane, Paul, T-Storm, good morning to you. Mike K, praise be to God. Thanks for hanging out. Karen Collins, good morning to you. Eileen, good morning to you. Posting pictures with... Uh, with uh, Michael Hitchborn at the Catholic Identity Conference. That's super cool. Praise be to God. Um, uh, Jerome, good morning to you. Good morning. Praise be to Jesus. Jane Steves, good morning. Jen Nugent, good morning to you. Sci-Fi, I see there. Trad Jack Burden, Tweed and Toe, good morning to you. Thanks for hanging out on our Telegram group. We had a few more members join yesterday. I love to see you guys here. 
Uh, I see Don Franco. Good morning. Says uh, fascinating discussion. As I'm, it's so far away, and I'm so old. Fascinating discussion. Could you buy? Could by location as Padre Pio did actually be his guardian angel doing this on his behalf? I'm going to say no. Morning to you all. Fascinating discussion. Okay, so I somehow got duplicated. I'm going to say no. I do not believe it, that was his guardian angel doing it on his behalf. I believe God actually had Padre Pio in two places at the same time. That's part of one of those uh, one of those gifts that is uh, a grace of God, and it's not specific to Padre Pio. Others have had bilocations, and to include our our Blessed Mother, we, when she was yet alive, uh, she appeared in, in uh, Pilar, Spain, to Saint James. And she bilocated there. So no, two places at once. Clearly, it's only something God can do if he chooses to do so. And very few people have that ability of that charism, but uh, certainly Padre Pio did. But I do not believe it was his guardian angel. Um, what I find fascinating, and Mike, feel free to, to uh, chime in here. When I, when I listened to, I wanted to play some of these clips from these, uh, you know, I consider Tucker Carlson, he's a Protestant. I could still consider mostly secularist, to be honest with you. But when I, I, and I play that clip... You know, what I hear is sincerity. He's dug into the issue, and he's like, I do not like what I found. This is scary. It's demonic, and I don't want to play with it anymore. I'm done. That's what I hear when I listen to him talk about it. When I listen to this on Redacted, for instance, when I listen to this former FBI agent talking, he doesn't seem like a believer. He seems like a secularist. And But the way he talks about it, it's at least he's being honest and saying, what we see in authentic... Uh, UFO alien encounters is not what we see when we see these little pills flying around over the ocean harassing Navy pilots. Like those, these things aren't the same or the drones flying over Langley or the bases in Montana or whatever. Like he seems to be separating these two quite clearly. And he, and the way he described what he considered authentic is the spaceship is the actual being itself. There's no difference. They come in and out of material existence. They shape shift. Yeah. They, mm-hmm. There is this there is this other dimensional spiritual element to it. And I'm like, bro, that's called the demonic. It's so bloody obvious to us. Well, I mean, why can't they come that extra step and just realize what they're dealing with? They're still, it seems like even though they're being honest, they're still sort of rejecting the 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 obvious answer to all of this. Why would that be? I right. Mean, just- and that was the uh, part of the subtitle of the book, The End of the Supernatural, is that alarming um, tendency that so many people seem to have today where they're willing to recognize that these things are not physical objects. And like you said, like there's there are many people who have witnessed you know, UFOs like spacecraft UFOs that have said that that they that they they morph they change you know from beings to spacecraft um so many people who've said the spacecraft that i saw i it seemed to me like it was sentient it was a being it was an intelligent being the craft yeah. itself yeah. so not the aliens the craft yeah. itself but mm-hmm. um there's just this tendency to um, you t- so they people take that step where they recognize that these are not physical things, but they want those things to be part of this extraterrestrial experience. And, um, you know, even it's very alarming. I talked about Diana Pasolka. I mentioned her earlier. She is a professor of religion uh, at the University of Wilmington um, in the Carolinas, and she is a self-professed Catholic, but she is, has, and she's been on Joe Rogan and all of these big podcasts. And she's a darling of the UFO community because she totally promotes it. And she's written several books about ufology and about, and praising AI and, and everything else. And she has talked a lot about her belief that, um, the miracle of the sun at Fatima, the angelic visitation yeah. of um, of Saint Teresa of Avila and of Saint Francis of Assisi were UFO events, and even that Saint Francis's stigmata was radiation burns from his UFO event. And this is something that's being just praised by the secular community, um, saying like, see all of these events that. Catholics have called supernatural for millennia or have actually been UFO events. So that extraterrestrial hypothesis can explain all of this. 
And so we don't need the supernatural anymore because it's actually part of this natural phenomena that um, has been experienced, but it's an alien thing. It has nothing to do with God. Mike, you know, what's interesting about this? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. What what I was going to say, what's interesting about this is as as you're talking about, you know, people witnessing these, these crafts, and it seems like the craft itself is sentient. The translation that goes to the secularists, not to us. I mean, for us, we look at that and we go, that's demons. Uh, But for the secularists, what they see is, well, that's the natural end of AI, is that you create a spacecraft that has a mind of its own so that it can Mm -hmm. actually dodge and move and weave and maneuver uh, at its own thought process, as opposed to having somebody behind the stick and making the thing move. So if you can get AI to that level, well, then you've, you've, you know, ascended with the technology that, that moves with it. So this idea of AI, demons, uh, UFOs, alien beings, all of them kind of mesh together because ultimately what you're going to create is not, the, not just this idea of an alien messiah, as uh, Robert Heinlein wrote about in uh, Stranger in a Strange Land. But what you ultimately wind up with is an AI machine that has alien technology mixed with the occult practices of the Ouija board so that you're creating uh, a, a demonic entity that can communicate through technology to man. It's it's a, a hyper um, technological which board is ultimately yeah. all you're creating. Yeah, it really is. That's so well put. Yes. And you bring up, you know, AI and it's very interesting because there's all of such malicious stuff that's going on in that world. I wrote a little bit about in the book. Um, if you remember a couple of years ago, one of the Google techs who was um, programming and working with their Lambda chat bot, like the ultimate chat mm-hmm. bot, right? The AI chat bot. Blake Lemoyne, um, he did an extensive interview where he talked about that he real and he was fired because he said he realized that the chatbot was sentient and (sighs) Google denied it and everything else. But he did these long interviews about it where he talked about it turns out he was an occultist and actually followed Mm. Alistair Crowley and and all this stuff. What do you know? He said that when he found out that this thing was sentient, he and fellow occultists attempted to program it to create occult rituals. And they also <laughs> did rituals to put the chat bot into the service of the God <sighs> Thoth. He's like the God of, you know, knowledge and, and all of that. Mm-hmm. And so he says, I, I'm pretty sure that the Google chat bot is not in the service of a demon right now. That is well, literally this stuff is actually admittedly insane. going on, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the, well, the same okay, chat so... that we're talking to for information is supposedly like now a demon. So like... sure, yeah. You know, well, look, just look at uh, the artwork of H.R. Giger, who was the inspiration behind the Alien series. Yeah, uh, you exactly. know, H.R. Right, H. Right, Giger, right. his stuff was not only deeply occultic. But it was transhumanist. It, it showed this idea of people morphed with technology that were inspired by demonic beings. Everything about what he created as an art form was all uh, demonic, transhumanist AI nonsense. Um, I want to show, can, uh, Jay, can you just put my screen on for just a second? I want to show this image out of, uh, um, out of Europe. This is a this is a robot, like a like, like a, a mechanical device that's supposed to be art sculpture, and the Bishop of Toulouse, he he tried to push back on this. This was there was a parade of these kind of creatures, and uh, they're they're considered artwork, but they actually represent actual demons from ancient cultures. With names, actual demons that were worshipped, human sacrifices were made to them, etc. The Bishop of Toulouse pushed back, but he didn't push back all that hard. The story comes out of Lacroix. Um, I talked a little bit about this yesterday. The bishop actually consecrated his diocese to the Sacred Heart as a response to this. When he tried to push back, 
uh, against the display of these demonic icons, this demonic idol. He, uh, the, the artist is like, it's just art. I like mythology. Like, it's no big deal. But one of them is Satan himself, and then there's a bunch of these other demons. And, you know, and unfortunately, the bishop didn't, like, say, I'm the bishop in this diocese, and I cast you out. Like, he sh- like, put your miter on, grab your crozier, and act like a bishop. That's what I say. But he didn't do that. But what mm. he did do is he consecrated his diocese to the sacred heart. Okay, that's one step. But I think we have to say this far and no further. I think bishops have to get off the fence and say, this is unacceptable. This is horrible for humanity. It's not good for any soul, not just Catholic souls, but for all souls. Every soul in the diocese, which he's responsible for, 100% of every soul, not some souls, all of them. These bishops, they tolerate this stuff, and it's just going to get worse. Mankind, the average citizen, is okay with this kind of artwork, and that's the point that I wanted to make. We're so far gone that we've slid so far down this slippery slope that the average citizen is okay with looking at the devil, the diabolic demons, either an AI, an art form, or, or what have you. There's no hiding in the shadows now. The smoke of Satan is not just coming through a crack. It's pouring in in droves. And I believe that if the bishops don't get off the fence, we might just we might just see we might just see some very interesting things in the final age. You know, and going back to this idea uh, like this FBI agent brought up about a fake, a false UFO invasion to help, you know, sort of reorder society. I can imagine that if, like, Aleister Crowley's story in Loch Ness, you bring that up in the book, if mm. he opens this portal to the devil and the diabolic and that comes pouring into the world, then it goes unchecked and just gets worse. And it happens to be 1947, the same year of Roswell, the same year as Our Lady of Revelation, the same year uh, that uh, England gave, gave the Holy Land to the Jews. You know, it seems like a lot of things are happening in 1947. A lot of dots are being connected there. I could see, like, the, I was talking to Paul Thickpin about the three days of darkness. You know, the, the prophets have said that the very air itself will be infected with the diabolic. It seems like I could, I could almost see that just looking at the UFO uh, hype. What do you say, Ursula? Yeah, absolutely. I feel that way. And, you know, it's, it's interesting. I think you had um, Matthew Sakonikas on the show. I did. Yeah. And I I mentioned him a little bit in the book, and I think he's written a, a, some about this. And something that I think he was re- really right on about was that um, his conjecture that really the ills in our society today, it's very possible that we can connect those to this whole ufology thing. And the fact that governments, and specifically the United States government and Russia, have been for decades, you know, going back now 70, 75 years, have been engaging in occult activity themselves. They're, you yeah. know, our governmental yeah. agencies have been doing remote viewing. They've been doing um, occult rituals, all doing all these kinds MK of things Ultra, to try anyone, and communicate. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. To try and communicate with these beings, to have some relationship with these forces that they don't seem to understand. And um, Dr. Seneca said that he really believes the ills in our society are from this mm-hmm. large scale participation of our governments in occult activity over decades. And I tend to agree with him. Yeah. Yeah, I do too. I do too. And, you know, the, uh, the very idea of the, um, and I'm trying to remember exactly what it was that you said that, triggered my thought and now i've lost it <laughs> sorry <laughs> well I good morning to you <laughs> welcome to my world <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> it, it it is very bizarre the times we live in i remember uh i reading that comment ursula about the russians sort of bragging about well you you americans you you killed all your witches you know so right. now we have better witches yeah. than you do oh. like like talk about the yeah, errors of that's russia why you're that so, has spread. that's why you're so far behind in technology because yeah. they told us mm-hmm. because you killed all your witches like we've caught up now unfortunately that's what i was going to say you've got the three letter agencies that were promoting that they actually put together project stargate uh, which was this idea that you can have remote viewing and they would actually hire and bring people in to conduct these rituals where they would do remote viewing exercises to try and spy on the russians um 
And it is still in yeah. full force. And ufologists worship these people like Hal Pudoff and, yeah. you know, Yuri Geller and all of these people. They are superstars Yuri Geller. in the ufology world and very respected by secular people. In fact, Lou Elizondo, who just came out with his book, Imminent, who said that he was the director of this, you know, this UFO research program and was all over the news. When he first came out of the news in uh, 2023 during the con congressional hearing thing, he talked about the officials in the Pentagon told him, just like you mentioned earlier, Joe, that they knew now what these things were and don't do research into it anymore. Yeah. Leave it alone, right? Leave it alone. So when yeah. he came out with his book lately, um, you know, just a couple months ago, in fact, I had my book come out the exact same day, hoping that people would see mine too the same day and read it. Um, it came out in his book that he was involved in remote viewing himself when he was- uh, um, I'm surprised, a, yeah. You know, doing yeah, an that... intelligence uh, agent in the government. The occult link between all of these people, all of these characters, you know, that are the, the gurus and leaders of the movement, I think is uh, something that everybody needs to remind themselves of. You shouldn't be following along these people because yeah. they have they have uh, the, this occult tie. I think that's the red flag that should should be a deal breaker for all of it. Hey, let me give some more shout outs here. Helen Grace. Good morning to you. Evelyn, Miriam, KSW, Benedict, Noble, Chesty, Semper Fi, Deborah. Good morning to you. Praise be to God. Robert Hasenauer. Uh, good morning. Bigfoot demonic is Bigfoot demonic. That's interesting. You bring that up because uh, um, in the book you talk about Nephilim and what's fat. What you what I thought was fascinating about that is I'm I'm leading this Bible study Wednesday nights on salvation history, and uh, this coming Wednesday in that session we're going to be getting into to the uh, the the good line of Seth versus the evil line of Cain and how the the good line gets corrupted. Many people want to believe that this is. Uh, you know, uh, fallen angels having intercourse with with women and then creating giants that roam the earth. There, a lot of people want to believe that. I don't believe that. I don't subscribe to that. You quote St. Augustine. I love that. Uh, but some people believe that Nephilim are Bigfoot. That's kind of what I was bringing up, uh, Bigfoot. And I, I've always yeah. – one of the things I've always said about – we've talked about Bigfoot on this show in the past. It's like um, – the problem with the Bigfoot thing is you pull on that thread, all you're ever going to get is additional mystery. You never get conclusion. You never get satiation. Mm -hmm. You do produce a Bigfoot. It's like the uh, – who was that – who is that former, you know, Space Force major guy that was on? You you quote him in the book. You talk about him briefly in the book. I forget his name. He was on Tucker. He went to Capitol Hill. Oh, I have seen. I've seen the records. I've got lots of biologics. It's not even a word, dude. You just made up a word. Biologics is not a word. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. But anyway, um, mm -hmm. you know, there's so many threads here. You pull on them, and all you get is additional mystery. You never find the end, the end of, of the rope, right? Like you can pull all day long. You're never going to yeah. find it. And I feel that way about Bigfoot. As a hunter, and there's lots of great hunters out there, you would be hearing from hunters who would be like, yeah, I encounter them. I encounter them all the time. I find them all the time. We can find elk and moose in the craziest places, but we can't find Bigfoot. I'm sorry. You're selling, but I ain't mm -hmm. buying. So, uh, you know, a Bigfoot demonic, I think so. Yeah. I think it's p part of this story. Well, I think it's. Uh, at some point, too, there, you know, where you have, I think you started out where you have sporadic stories where people miss see something, they they think they saw something. And then, you know, that's all the devil needs. He just needs yeah. some interest in something. And then he starts providing little snippets, you know, a little glimpse of something, a little piece of so-called evidence there. It's just whatever he can provide to get people to, you know be on these wild goose chases. He loves to do that. So I think that would be another case where the devil is mimicking what, you know, providing what people want to see. And he'll just keep doing that forever. You know, like you said, it's just, so, it just never ends. Yeah. It's, it's very interesting. I actually just read a story, not a story. It was actually an account by a professional big Bigfoot chaser. This guy had dedicated the majority of his life to chasing Bigfoot, and the whole gist of what he wrote was, I will never chase after Bigfoot again. And what he got into was the cult of Bigfoot, where people are, they, they build their whole lives around chasing Bigfoot. And he said what really got him was discovering, 
discovering that uh, Bigfoot was telepathic and that Bigfoot would communicate through the mind and he could actually uh, start to get to the point where he could expect when Bigfoot would show up and he would uh, be hmm. able to see no him. Big and, red you know, flag. Uh, no, <laughs> yeah, massive Sounds red a little... flags. Diabolic? Anybody? Anyone? Anyone? Yeah, like that. But, we, it's there's yeah. That's the here. only way that aliens communicate too is telepathically. They're yeah. super advanced, but that's the only way they communicate. They don't have any fabulous mm-hmm. super tech communication devices. It's only right. telepathically. Strangely enough. Yeah, isn't that interesting? So the uh, other I, to your point ahead. about oh, I was I just wanted to say to your point about. Um, the devil appearing in the way that we expect him to, or, you know, you go, you get the ghost hunters that go into a haunted house. What do they expect to see? They expect to see stuff moving around or hearing spooky sounds, but it's interesting to me. I think that the devil has always appeared to people through the mythologies that they create. So in ancient Greece, what did they expect to see? They expected to see satyrs. They expected to see centaurs. They expected to see, you know, whatever the mythological mythological creature was, the devil would appear in those guises. The same thing with the Celts and the little people or the banshee. You know, the devil is going to use whatever mythology of the era is going to be, and that's the way he's going to show up. So with Bigfoot and UFOs and all that garbage, that's just the mythology that we have going for us right now. You know, it's especially you say the, that especially because, the UFOs because it's I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say it's I've always found it fascinating when it comes to the UFO alien UAP stuff is college you is why do these extraterrestrial life forms from other planets? Why do they only work with world governments? You know what mm. I mean? Like it's, it's bizarre. <laughs> yeah, right. this, this is bizarre. Like they come here from from light years away with their advanced technology and only the governments know about their existence officially. Mm-hmm. That doesn't mm-hmm. pass the smell test. Like, you know what I mean? Like, this is dumb. It's uh, and and somehow, as the uh, the the UFO UAP whistleblower uh, said on Tucker Carlson, you know, it's classified. He can't tell us. We're the bloody taxpayer. Uh, I, I'm sorry, but why can't we know about aliens visiting from another planet? That also doesn't pass right. the smell test. The and very fact the whist- that you have gnostic that are, information you know, that we're yeah. not privy to is a red flag. I think most most Christians mm-hmm. should be like, mm, sorry, I don't, I don't, I can't go there. But, the, but yeah, we, they we buy it. Come line forward and, and tell us that they they're 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 standing up because they want to tell us what's been hidden from us. But then they tell. can't actually tell us. Right. It's all, it's just it's like the Bigfoot thing. It's just you keep pulling the thread and you just get more mystery, more mystery, more. I and mean, you might as well watch Tim Kennedy hunt Nazis down in Patagonia. It's at least entertaining. <laughs> at the very, You know what I mean? Like, good grief. What are we talking right. about here? Uh, but it just boggles the mind that it's always secret intelligence. It's always classified. Only the of the upper echelon can know about these things. It's just really, really bizarre. And I think that all, always should be a red flag. But um, uh, there was something else I wanted to point out. And, oh, now it's escaped my mind, Mike. Uh, so you I, just I, gave I, me a great you, idea. Of, you passed great it idea on for my me. next movie, Joe. What's that? Nazi Bigfoots. Nazi <laughs> Bigfoots. Uh, someone had put out a movie, a movie about movie. cockroaches being shipped to Mars and then becoming alien creatures. <laughs> So, you know, that would be that someone's right worst up uh, me and sci-fi, right there. me and sci-fi <laughs> Mike's alley. <laughs> Angel Knight, good morning to you. Says if you look at the picture, the little blue dot taken from Voyager one or two, space is so empty and the distance so extremely vast. No other life is out there that can affect us. Well, I do agree, and I keep bringing up Ad Astra for that very reason. Brad Pitt, Ad Astra. Um, There's a great mm-hmm. film. It's a slow burn. Really can be boring at times, but the point of the film is there's nothing out there. We're it. Yep. We're it. And I, I was, I'm still blown away by that Hollywood make would make such a film. But there is, and I believe this because I see like, uh, I see like an increased intensity in, hey, some big UFO shoe is about to drop. Like there's a lot of people saying some big UFO shoe is coming. Get ready. Mm-hmm. So there's talk about uh, there's talk about this radio signal that they've received from other parts, distant parts mm-hmm. of the galaxy. There's talk about that. The uh, the the FBI agent guy he was saying that he believes there's, there's going to be like a fake UFO invasion. He even talked about the whole blue laser project. What was that called? It was like oh, I was on page oh, seventy-seven. Yeah. 
you mentioned that in your book, actually. It's called uh, Pl- Project Blue Beam. He even comments on that. Mm-hmm. He says, nope, it's not going to be holograms. It will be actual physical things. He goes, but that's how you know it's fake, because they're physical. He says the real aliens are not physical. They are interdimensional, not physical. But the but what we're going to see is a is a fake invasion used with using physical objects with technology created by Lockheed Martin and global government mm-hmm. cover, governance, uh, you know, things of that nature. So yeah, do you, and I think what's do you so think there's credibility to, I guess my question is, do you think there's credibility to the, these sort of this cabal of elitist leveraging this mass manipulation to reorder society? Do you think they're actually, do they have the courage to actually yeah. attempt such a thing? Yeah, I do think that there is something like that that's kind of in the back pocket. I don't know to what extent it's actually planned or developed or anything like that. But um, I am absolutely convinced now that there has been for a long time, um, like we, we talked about earlier, that the, that the UFO story, the extraterrestrial hypothesis, has been a convenient way to cover up a lot of things. You know, And we know about... Um, disinformation agents like the the main one is um richard doty who I wrote extensively about in the book who is just a legend in the ufo community who has m- deliberately misled many people who was literally sent out by the government into the ufo community to plant fake stories about mm-hmm. ufos and extraterrestrial life to cover up technology development in the government so we know we know that's that's true. We know that's been going on for decades. So um, so if we know, you know, we, you mentioned cockroaches a minute ago. You know, if we know there's one cockroach, there's a lot more cockroaches. Amen. So if we know that yeah. there's a some level of disinformation going on that's been going on. There's a lot more, obviously. So to what yeah. extent, I don't know. Are they really going to roll out some? massive deception on a worldwide scale to get us to abandon religion and 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 you know start the one world order um or finalize i should say the one world order um Mm -hmm. i don't know but there's there's a lot of you know whether we we've talked a lot about like demons appearing and shape-shifting and possessing people and and all of this in the ufo movement and whether or not you believe any of that I think, and I end the book with this, there's no doubt that the devil's hoof print is on all of it because of all the lies Mm -hmm. and deception. I mean, it is indisputable that the devil's involved in it because it is just nothing but one big lie, you know, going on for all of these years. And um, so, yeah, so whether you believe in all those nuanced things, you know, that people are experiencing everything else, um, that's you know neither here nor there in my opinion because there is no doubt that the devil's involved in it just yeah. because of the deception sure. the devil well is said. attracted to lies the way flies are attracted to mm-hmm. feces so it's um <laughs> mm-hmm. it's true it's silent fire 88 good morning to you praise be to jesus janice good morning mac thompson says uh i don't think the possibility of alien life is counter to being a Christian, God is by no means obligated mm. to tell us everything he has ever done. Our concern here is on earth. Okay, that may be, it's a fair point, I would say. God isn't obligated to tell us about everything he's ever done. In fact, I think it's going to be one of the great mysteries that we will discover in the beatific vision that he's created creatures that we don't even know exist, but he does. He knows they exist. And, uh, you know, it's just part of the beauty of his incredible creation. We find these creatures sometimes you know, through scientific study and exploration, there are the depths of the Mariana Trench or whatever, like, wow, we didn't know that thing existed. That's pretty cool. And yet it's there. So that's true. It's possible. I could see it. But I don't think that's the point. It's not that God can't do these things. It's that God's chosen not to do these things. And I think that's the point, is he has an intention and a design. We may not like or agree with all of these intentions and designs, but who cares what we like or agree with? It's what God designed and we have to get with that. And I think that's, I think that's the point where, like I'm trying to make for sure, is it's not that he couldn't create creatures out there. The fact that he created a vast universe to play ground in is amazing to me. I have no issue with and exploring think, 
exploring the universe, for instance. Yeah. My wife and I have discussed this before. Why go to Mars at all? <laughs> because we can. Because we're man. <laughs> and we, we should be the Adam. And we should go into the wilderness and extend the garden boundary. We should make God's will be done on Earth as it is in heaven. And we should, we should embrace that. I don't have an issue with that as long as we do it from a Catholic perspective. But I think if we start to think that we, we start to buy those lies. And this is where I c- keep coming back to the fact that aliens work with only secret intelligence agencies in the highest echelons of the government is the red flag. So just as me, just as a demon could harass me personally, and then it can harass my house with my wife and kids, well, certainly it could then harass the next three houses, right? And then maybe it could harass my whole neighborhood, and possibly it could harass my city, and then my state, and then my country, and the world. So at every level of human society and organization, there could be diabolic influence and harassment, and, and even worse— Right. And Alistair uh, Crowley sort of opening that portal in 1947, making that an example. So if you're at the highest levels of government and you're a big state, deep state bureaucracy, elitist, world one, one world power kind of people, you want power, control and money. Those are your motivations. Mm-hmm. And you talk to a demon and they're like, well, let me help you with that. Right. Mm-hmm. Because the demon is going to leverage you to capture and destroy and corrupt many souls. I mean, it's like a 10x capability. So if you have access to millions of human beings that you can impact and I can manipulate them through you, well, all right, that's good. Praise be to God. That's part of the strategy. I mean, the devil would never say praise be to God, but you get my point. And (laughs) I've always seen it that way, like this whole manipulation of peoples at every level. So it makes sense to me. But as we said now many times already in this conversation, it doesn't make sense to a vast majority of human beings on planet Earth who buy into all of this stuff, who play around with things like Ouija boards, palm reading, crystals, yoga, and all this other stuff. Those are our friends. Those are our neighbors. Those are our family members. Those are our lost loved ones that we – that our children that we sent off to college and now are pagan atheists. You know, like this is a big issue, which leads me back to St. Paul and what he said, uh, you know, that there would be a great apostasy. How do you get to apostasy? It doesn't just happen Tuesdays at three o'clock. You have to build to it. The great lies that the devil and the demons have been giving us since the fall of mankind in Genesis chapter three. This is part of that strategy to 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 get society to a point where they will accept something as insane as the true Messiah coming to us from from another planet on a spaceship, and then we all just buy along with it. Like that, I, I believe that's a legitimate potential. Anyway, you were going to say I think it was uh, either Ursula or Mike. I can't. I cut you off. I'm sorry. <laughs> I think both of us were going to oh, say no. something. I just want to jump in real quick because um, I wrote an article directly to your commenters' uh, comment about <clears throat> the cosmology and and what we can expect. Uh, you know, God could have made things like this. He could have done things this way. Why Why should we, you know, limit God? The problem is the idea of intelligent extraterrestrial life does not fit into any kind of uh, cosmic understanding of salvation at all. God revealed to right. us that there is an invisible world called the angelic realm. He revealed to us that there is an infinite, well, there's a finite, but a very large number of species, individual species, that are uh, intelligent, angelic intelligences, demons and angels. Um, so he revealed that invisible world to us. Where does an intelligent life that would have developed out of some Darwinian evolution uh, on another planet uh, have any kind of religion, and how would they be able to worship God in the incarnation, which right. happened here on Earth once for all the universe? Uh, right. There's no way th- it, it would right. be the height of cruelty for God to create an intelligent life that could not worship him in in a proper manner. Uh, so what you have now is and, and, and I'll get to uh, I, I'll end my point with this. What you have is a very serious cosmological problem by introducing alien intelligent life. And you're saying that God would create an intelligence that has no connection with the incarnation. I'm every creature was represented at the incarnation. Every single one. You have the wood of the cross that was in the form of the manger. You have the animals uh, that were there in the manger. You have the angels and you have people and you have people of every class there in the manger, all of 
humanity, all of creation was represented right there in the manger. Where are the aliens? Hmm. That's true. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, that that's what really got me into the, the study of ufology was when I, you know, when this all came out a few years ago, people started talking about UFOs in Congress. And I started to look into it with my own experiences with the occult. And I mean, it was five minutes when you're just reasoning as a Christian to realize that there's no that you can't have extraterrestrial life without talking and, and within five minutes you have to start talking about essentially the reincarnation of jesus you know and of mary for that matter and theologians are willing to do that you know and it's that it's it's an abomination it's an absolute mm-hmm. abomination and it can't happen and they say well maybe th- these beings didn't need salvation. Maybe they didn't fall like we did. But then you're getting into the area where you think, well, then they must have been created without free will. Because like, I I mean, how possible is it that they didn't fall? And there's no possible way that God would have created creatures without free will. So like, and, you know, but like you said, Michael, at the bottom of it, or at the top of it, you have to realize that Jesus is Jesus of Nazareth. He is a man, you know, and Mm -hmm. he is a human being. And there is no way to reconcile that with other intelligent beings in the universe. And the other thing, too, that I've thought about a lot is what, you know, what and people think like, well, what's all that space for if we do think, you know, God thinks like us and he did create this huge universe, which is not big to him, by the way. Right. Yeah, right. um, Exactly. Yeah. You know, if if he meant it for us not to fall and for there to be no death, then certainly there would be a lot more of us and a lot more animals and everything else. And there had to be room for yeah. us to go. Right. So but maybe it's we're still going to go there. Maybe it's all it's for the us. Same maybe reason we're, why... we're going to go out and populate all of it. It's the same reason why when you walk into St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, the letters that line the top are 10 feet tall. Because you look mm-hmm. up and you, you're, you're in awe and wonder of the grandeur and the yeah. epicness. The, the largest church on the planet is so massive in volume, you cannot help but look up when you walk into the space. Mm-hmm. Same thing when you walk the Alps or, or you go to Mount Everest. You're in awe of God's grandeur. I can't, I, it always boggles the, my, my mind. I've said this so many times. When you look at a, a, all the United States rated by religiousness in polls that come out every couple of years or whatever, Alaska is always at the bottom of the list. Maine, Massachusetts, bottom of the list. So these are, these are very beautiful places on planet Earth. You go to Alaska, I don't know how you can't give God uh, uh, you know, like credit for creating something so majestic, something so awe-inspiring, something so amazing. I don't know how you do that. How do you look at a mountain, a valley, a river, an ocean, and not be in awe of the wonder of God? Same thing with his universe. He, he does it to give... To not only give himself glory, but but it to give us the ability to be in glory, to like to be praising him for all of his majesty, all of his grandeur, uh, the epic, the epicness of what it means to be a part of his creation. It's so vast, it's so amazing. You know, I had a conversation with my priest a couple weeks ago about this, and I said, you know, I've always wondered like what it would be like to move at the at the speed of thought in the resurrection, right? Like when we get our resurrected bodies and we are we are. So we are like Jesus, and we can move with the speed of thought. Well, I, will I, will I want to explore the edges of the universe? Uh, it, you know, probably not. I'm probably going to be too enamored and too yeah. satiated with being in the direct presence of God face to face. Why would I care about a rock that is cold and lifeless and formless? Some other galaxy or star system, right? Because no matter how many times they tell you. There are Earth-like planets out there. No, there are no Earth-like planets out there. Oh, there's a moon that goes around Jupiter or something, and it might have water. Listen, send all the probes you want. You cannot land there, get out of your spaceship, walk around, and go fishing. It does not exist. Right. It does not happen. You, yeah. you have to bring 100% of everything you need to survive and hope that nothing goes wrong. I've seen the documentary films uh, with uh, Matt Damon called Martian. Okay, listen, it doesn't work out well in the end. You, there is zero <laughs> planets 
anywhere in our observation that are Earth-like, but they love to tell you they're Earth-like. Not a single one so is Joe, Earth-like. This is the only one. As, as an artist, I will tell you, you know, talking about the empty space, the vastness of space and that kind of thing. As an artist, I will tell you the most important thing in, put, in composing a piece is the negative space. Because the only way that you're going to draw the eye to the object of, of your, your artistic talent is the negative space. If you have too much stuff going on, you can't allow the eye to rest to really focus on the thing that you want the, the viewer to focus on. And, and if God is the ultimate artist, and if Christ in his incarnation is the ultimate thing for us to rest our eyes upon then the, nest, the, the empty space is necessary for that, which puts the uniqueness of this planet in stark contrast to this idea that there could be intelligent life elsewhere. Right. Yeah. We're it. But we can't good accept point. that, right? Like yeah. We, we have to Excellent reject point. that. Speaking of art, Edward Clancy, good morning to you, Edward, over on the Rumbles, along with Limpine, Apoc, Gabriel, Cherokee Woman 20. Good morning, good morning. Rosie, I see you there. But uh, Edward says, what about Rupnik artwork? The Holy images look like sci-fi, you know, uh, science fiction artwork. Yeah, Rubnik artwork is just, it's horrible. The, eye, like the eyes are, creatures. <laughs> are empty and black like, uh, like the eyes of the greys. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, the eyes of the greys. Now, that's another thing. Um, Ursula, you start the book off. You, you, was, did I understand this correctly? Your brother was having issues when you guys were kids? Yes. Um, we grew up in a house here on the north side of Chicago that was built by my uncle in uh, 1912. And uh, by the time we moved into it, it was very run down. It was known as the haunted house of the neighborhood. OK, so we moved wow. into it and we were having experiences. Our, our whole family was hearing footsteps on the stairs at night and other things were going on. But my brother always had more pronounced experiences. Like he would hear knockings and he would hear the piano playing when no one was home and things like that. And he was also having experiences where, and we would call them his dreams. He would dream of being visited by aliens and sometimes being taken away. And, um, yeah, we always said like, oh, these are just dreams he was having and, and things like that. But, um, and it was, was not until recent years that, you know, I realized what was going on in our house wasn't that it was haunted because we were having, um, all those experiences when we were growing up to, and when my dad passed away in 1986, like all hell broke loose in the house. And of course, you know, being naive, we thought like, oh, it's our it's our dad, you know, we, he needs help crossing over. Oh, wow. And, um, we had a priest come over as a young priest. He had just been ordained. He came over to dinner and we had to actually stop dinner because we heard someone running around in the hall upstairs. And of course we went from room to room and he said the prayers for every room blessing the house. And that was the end of it until my mom passed away. A few. Yes. Mm. And until my mom passed away a few years ago and the same thing happened, like I was at my mom's house a few days after her death, um, putting things away, cleaning because we were going to have to sell the house. And um, the the um, power of attorney was really insistent that we get it going. So I was over there by myself cleaning and I was really, you know, grieving, upset. I was crying. And um, I was talking to my mom like out loud and crying. Right. And which you should never do. <laughs> you should never talk to our dead loved ones. It's a bad idea. Um, but all of a sudden, a few rooms away, I heard this huge expl- like explosion. And wow. she kept her microwave oven on the back porch next to the kitchen. And the door of the microwave had just imploded. No one in the house, no one nearby. Yeah. And... I actually called up a friend of mine, Ralph Sarchi. Um, oh, sure. I've interviewed might have him. had him on your mm-hmm. show. Yeah. Um, who was a New York police um, sergeant who who was involved in doing deliverance work and a, an exorcism assistant as well. In fact, was trained by Malagy Martin. Right. And so I called him up and I said, you know, I'm really concerned because my mom passed away and this, you know, these things are going on in the house and my my uh, husband and our daughter were living there at the time as well. And they were hearing footsteps. They were seeing the doors opening and things like that. And he just said, 
flat out, that's not your mother. And um, I told him about the things that had happened throughout our entire life living there, you know, from when I was young and the ghost in our house. And then when my dad passed away and he went on to finally explain to me um, that, you know, when our loved ones pass away, these demonic entities take the opportunity to try to convince us mm -hmm. that they are our dead relatives and to try to engage us in conversation with them, just like I was doing, you know, in the house. And um, it's really interesting because it's very difficult to maneuver this, you know, as a Catholic, because we know that sometimes our loved ones do need reach out to us, that God does allow them to reach out to us for prayer and things like that, or masses uh, after they pass away. But it's very rare and it's not on that level. And Ralph was very clear about that, that these very pronounced activities, you know, objects moving around, doors opening and closing, loud noises. These are not the things that our loved ones do. What they, the way they approach us is very subtle. They never will communicate with us, like speak to us because that's not allowed by God. But um, it's, it can be very difficult to, to maneuver this. And, and again, just something very simple, like wanting to talk to our love, oh, gosh, mom, I really miss you is we should not even be doing things like that. We should give those messages to our guardian angel to give to, mm. um, you know, and we should never, ever engage in conversation with any dead person. That's not, we, that we don't know is in heaven are the saints, you know, the saints that we know. Uh, and of course the blessed mother and Jesus. So, um, but it's tough, you know, but yeah, those were the things that were going in our house. So we were experiencing ghosts and haunting phenomena. My brother was experiencing something very different. He was experiencing parts of this UFO phenomena. And I talk about this in my book. I don't know um, if you got to this part, but it was just a few years ago. My brother is actually in the intelligence community today. And mm. um, a few years ago, he was also in uh, the Naval Reserve's and uh, as an intelligence officer and he was coming home from his duty weekend and he called me up in tears and he had um had gotten this was when text messaging first became a thing he got a text message and it was like the first text message he had ever got he had to pull over and figure out how to open it and read it book. yeah and it said prepare to shed your container and um, he was absolutely terrified. He didn't know. He thought he was going to die, that these things from his childhood were going to come back and get him and take him away. And it's interesting because, um, as you probably read in the book, the idea of aliens as um, looking at humans as containers, especially containers for the soul, right. is prevalent throughout ufology. Like everyone talks about it, that there is all of these like declassified reports where, you know, people have been debriefed about how aliens are interested in our souls and they see our bodies as containers for souls. And oh. they're extremely interested in this. What was that movie? Weird stuff going there was on a movie, there. There was a movie I want to say was from maybe the eighties and maybe the nineties. It was like an alien movie where they, we were described as bags of mostly water. Oh, oh I, I got, wow. I got the reference in my mind, but I can't remember the film. Jake, does that ring any bells to you? It's ringing bags, a bell, but I can't determine where the bell is coming from. mostly water. Yeah. Was that a Star Trek reference? Uh, there's, 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 might have it's been. a common joke in, I think, in sci fi and sci fi circles to, yeah. to talk about, uh, you know, to dismissively refer to human bodies. That's in that so way. typical, isn't it? Just the dismiss, the dismissive nature of humans. And yeah. Daniel O'Connor talks heavily about this in his book about this. It's just a poison in our culture that like to just put down humanity. You know, we're just trash. Yeah, there's garbage. a there's a there's a Star Wars character that refers to human beings as meat bags, you know, and things like that. So it's, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. That's, that's, that's a that's yeah. a common it's common, common in sci fi to just common. dismiss dismiss humanity and um and especially dismiss the human body. Yeah, meat, mm -hmm. meat puppets. Meat puppets. Yes. Yeah. Meat puppets. Yeah. Oh, yes. wasn't that Men in Black too? Didn't they make have a reference? Yeah, like probably. That? Yeah. 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 Speaking of Men in Black, oh, in that, the book that, I think it was Men in Black that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the Men in Black and that Men in Black. You know, there's this idea that people are visited after encounters by these Men in Black. That's something else that's throughout folklore, going back hundreds or even thousands of years. Mm. Um, you know, the devil coming to visit people and um 
uh, John Keel, very famous uh, ufologist and Fordian scholar who did the Mothman prophecies. Um, he taught, he wrote a lot about the men in black and about how there, it's just the modern, um, inter, you know, modern reappearance of something that's been happening for hundreds or even thousands of years with the devil appearing to people. And it's just, um, you know, a more modern way of that happening or a modern interpretation of that. Mm. Um, Don Franco brings up M night Shyamalan. I, that's interesting. Remember the movie, was it signs? It was signs, right? Mm -hmm. M. Night Shyamalan signs, yeah. with, uh, with Mel Gibson. Movie. That's movie. actually quite fascinating because there is a, I was watching a, um, a video probably a couple months back now that was diagnosing or sort of analyzing M. Night Shyamalan signs. And there's a Catholic layer that you can overlay on top of that. Mm -hmm. uh, in looking at the, the, those aliens as demons, they were yep. being depicted mm -hmm. as yeah. demons, afraid of holy water. And, uh, and it was a very, very yep. fascinating. In fact, I reached out to Father uh, Alloy at our parish. Who is a, he's a movie buff guy, too. And I thought maybe it'd be fun to get him on the team to, to maybe talk about that because I thought that was very interesting, seeing aliens as yeah. actual uh, spiritual demons. But uh, Las Creole says, please clarify, we are not to speak or pray to our deceased we should do so to our guardian angels. So I would say this, Las Creole. Um, I think one thing that is that is uh, I think a real risk is if we're in an emotional state, grieving, mm -hmm. for, in, for instance. There's a real opportunity there to be manipulated, and and uh, the, you know that's a moment that the enemy could strike because you're at an emotional you know point where you're just you're still struggling with the loss of your loved one or whatever. And because you're an emotional state and not a rational state, you might be manipulated, right? So I think therein lies the danger. So out of a sense of caution, you might uh, you might just you know pray for the repose, and and then of course you know ask your guardian angel for help. I think that would be I think that'd be good advice. But I think it all comes down to whether or not you're are, are you thinking rationally or are you thinking emotionally? And I think when we think emotionally, we think bad things could be ha could happen in the. And the devils, the demons, they're they in, they can intuit, they can they're like better than Sherlock Holmes. They can put the they can connect the dots better than anybody because they have superior intellects. So if they see an opportunity yeah. there, if they intuit an opportunity, they may they may pounce and take advantage. And then you might you might start to believe or buy that it's your dead loved one that that's there, right? I think that's the risk. Yeah, Ursula, did you want to weigh in on that again? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and it's, it's the risk. It's the risk. And I always think that it's better to not take that risk, um, you know, and, and yeah. it's good, too, because, you know, why not take advantage of the relationships and foster the relationships that we have with the Blessed Mother and our guardian angels and the saints? Give them those messages to take to our loved ones, um, because that way you avoid any risk at all. And you also foster those relationships that we yeah. all depend on so much or should. Sure. Michael, did you want to weigh in on that? Um, you, you know, when it comes to how to pray and whether to pray, obviously prayer is always a good thing. If there is a consolation that comes with prayer, that's, that's a good thing. I, I don't think that we should be looking for any signs. We shouldn't be looking for any kind of indications. God, you know, please show me that my, my loved one made it into heaven or yeah, that's that's a dangerous thing. You're opening, you're opening a lot of um, opportunity, as you put it, for the devil to go in and manipulate. Uh, as a skeptic, I mean, I <laughs> if if any kind of ghost of my family ever appeared to me, my first reaction would be, "You're not who you say you are, are you?" I mean, I, I'm such a skeptic. I wouldn't. My my immediate reaction would not be, "Gosh, I'm so happy to see you." Um, I just don't, I don't know. It's, if you're going to pray, pray for the repose of their soul and right, pray yeah. to be reunited with them when the time comes for you to also meet your maker and, uh, and be judged. That's yeah, the only well way said. that we're going to be able to handle that kind of thing. I think. Yes, well, we absolutely. are out of time. We are out of time. Ursula, it was great to have you on. Thanks for hanging out and sharing your book Thank with you us. So Praise be to God. Again, we're going to link to it in the show notes. Michael Hitchborn, always great to have you on the team. Praise be to God. Uh, thanks for your time this morning and uh, especially sharing the results of that survey, which 
is both sad and good all at the same time. It's good that so many average Catholics are recognizing that this is a problem and maybe we can turn our hearts back. Who knows, bishops? Maybe if you listen, good things could happen again. And maybe we can be fortified so that we're not uh, so susceptible to such lies manipulation that might head our way from green men from Mars or from the watery planet around Saturn. (laughs) I don't know where it is. Anyway, God bless you all. Thanks for hanging out. We'll see you right here on Monday morning. Until then, share us with a friend. Have a great day.